Раз. You did yeah. study rocket science like that. I did. Oh, hey, hey. Ooh. I can't say anything now. I will try. That, that sounds great. Okay. So, and we have to start in uh, six sharp. Six sharp, exactly. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce to you our speaker, guest speaker from London, George Berkowski. Uh, who is a serial entrepreneur and the author of the brand new book, How to Build a Billion Dollar App. George uh, is one of the minds behind the uh, internationally uh, successful uh, uh, application, tax application Halo, uh, which operates right now in 18 cities across six countries. George joined the company as one of the first employees and helped uh, to grow it to over 20, uh, 220 people and hundreds of millions in revenue. Later in his career, he co-founded the dating site Wumi, uh, which grew to people and was successfully sold to the biggest dating website in the world, Zusk. Uh, George is, uh, is a consultant and has worked, with, has worked with many startups around the world and is heavily involved in the tech scene both in the UK and the US and splits his time between London and San Francisco uh, lately. Uh, and I'm sure he will tell you more about his book and, about, uh, and will give you great advice on how to build your next uh, billion dollar app. Please welcome. Oh, do I take that too? Yes, no, no, I've got think. too many microphones here. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. This is great. Um, tell me if these things don't um, sound right at all. Um, good. Um, so the first thing is, is I never intended to write a book. I'm, I'm not really a writer. I'm an engineer by training. I'm a rocket scientist. I've worked in Kazakhstan before. Um, I actually worked back there when the Mir space station was still in orbit and we sent a couple of space tourists up there, the first one being Dennis Tito, so I love Kazakhstan, beautiful place, Baikonur is amazing. Um, but I never intended to write a book. What I wanted to do post Halo was actually come up with another idea for another startup. And all the kind of lessons and learning in the book are really about how to build a really great technology company. It just happens to be about mobile now because mobile is the area of the fastest growth and possibly the most kind of exciting area. And kind of as it turned out, being a good entrepreneur, I'm like, look, if I'm going to do all this research to build a way, you know, why not do 
better research. Why not do it? Ended up, I got introduced to someone. They said, are you writing a book? I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? I'm writing a book. And throughout the course of the last 18 months, was able to kind of really research that in massive detail and talk to the 13 different companies um, who on this list, which is you know a, a little bit kind of uh, small, but they're the $13 billion apps that are out there. And over the course of about the last four or five years, all of these companies have gone from absolutely nothing, you know, a, a dream in a bedroom or the other's head who has done lots of different businesses to multi-billion dollar businesses. And, and these are kind of crazy. Some of the businesses have absolutely no business model whatsoever, like Instagram. Other ones have got really, really robust business models and have IPO'd for billions of dollars. The most recent one, kind of on, on the top level there, if you recognize the logo on the top right, is called Kakao Talk, um, which is really popular in Japan and Korea. And the company makes about $300, $400 million a year for a four, four and a half year old company and just IPO'd for nine and a half billion dollars. You know, granted, the entrepreneurs behind the company knew exactly what they were doing, but there are some really interesting opportunities like we've never seen before in terms of mobile. And if you look at the top level of those companies, these are the companies that are worth tens of billions of dollars justifiably because they have real businesses and they're still only four or five years old. You know, the top one, everyone knows WhatsApp and, and their sale now, which is valued at about $21 billion all in um, due to stock inflation at, at Facebook. You know, Uber, KakaoTalk, Snapchat, and then other uh, wonderful billion-dollar apps, of which we have one in London, Candy Crush. Who, who's played Candy Crush, the game? Anyone? Fantastic. But the really interesting thing is that story of Candy Crush, that company behind it, I've actually known the CEO for the last 12 years. He's been building the same company for 12 long years. And it's a company. It's got 1,500 employees. It has 150 games in the App Store. And Candy Crush makes 90% of their revenues and was an accident. And it was created by eight guys. And it was released before Christmas. And they all went and had a very depressed Christmas because the whole company wasn't doing as well as it could have. They came back at the end of January and all the numbers were off the charts. So there's, for every one of these billion dollar app startups, there is a story that you kind of won't believe or understand. But you know, one metrics or one of the most important characteristics is these guys persevered for huge periods of time to make these businesses successful and luck is a huge component. <laughs> One reason that the opportunities in mobile are so interesting is that mobile is really the art of reinvention. And it, it's less about being Leonardo da Vinci and creating something amazing and new, and it's much more about execution. It is much more about delivery and translation of something that is already a great idea that could work way better in terms of a mobile app. And that's still the opportunity that we have today. So there are still great billion dollar apps out there that haven't been built yet. But one of those things, those characteristics of these entrepreneurs who build these, this guy, he lost his mother, he lost three sons, he lost a sister, he lost a girlfriend, he failed in business, and he lost eight elections. This is just a really good kind of example of an American who persisted and who at the end of the day became president of the United States when he was 52 years old. So the one kind of characteristic of guys who build businesses is you know, perseverance is, is pretty tough. When everything has failed, it could still be absolutely successful the next day. And we'll, we'll go into kind of the story of WhatsApp, which is a particularly interesting one as well. But first, who recognizes this site? This was a billion, or this became the first billion dollar app. This was Kevin Systrom's first attempt at Instagram. It was called Bourbon. And it was just another wonderful social kind of check-in, location-based website. And it went absolutely nowhere. But all of these apps too, none of them actually succeeded on their first attempts. They weren't the same businesses that people were trying to build. WhatsApp was a fantastic example. You know, Jan quit Yahoo, was looking to do something you know, interesting and different. And for the first nine months of the life of WhatsApp, it was a status sharing app. His story was, I want to go to the gym and I want to tell people that I'm busy and I can't. 
And I want to build an app for that. Maybe not the greatest idea in the world, but what he did is he put the app out there and people said, yeah, kind of okay idea, but what I'd love to do is be able to tell you via the app that I'm actually busy or you can't talk to me because there was no messaging function in this whatsoever. And interestingly, you know, Jan's from the Ukraine and Russia and one of the big things was is that his friends were like, well, yeah, I'd love to communicate with you guys, but texts are too expensive. You Americans sending to us, it's not particularly expensive, but for us to send to America is really expensive. So he built messaging into the app. And so they built that in iOS, first of all, for the iPhone. And then very, very quickly afterwards, they built it for the BlackBerry. Because that's what people were using outside of the US at the time. And very quickly, he got organically a few hundred thousand downloads. But that was nine months, ten months into the life of his company. And he almost gave up. He almost quit. He thought his idea was so bad. But he released the product. He talked to people out there. And that's the big kind of message that I want to kind of communicate here as well. Here's what you're up against if you're trying to launch a business now. And I'm actually in the middle of this process as well. We're launching a new app in the next few weeks. So I'm all too aware of how complex this is. But you know, how many apps are US smartphone users using every month? It's capping out. You know, we're, we're seeing the number you know, around about 28, 29. And over the last few years, that's been plateauing. So what, is it, what does that mean effectively if you're launching a new business? Isn't it the same for you know, kind of internet websites or other technology companies is if you want to get in there and become a top app, you either have to create something brand new or you have to move one of these 30 odd apps out of the way. Because you're not going to add to the amount of time that people spend on this because they're already spending 18 hours a day, you know, awake. They're already spending X proportion of that online and in apps. Even more depressing is that people are spending 75% of their time on their top four apps. So the rest of us, the other you know, 26 or uh, 24 apps, are fighting for 25% of people's time. What, what does all this say? All this really means you have to build something amazing that people actively want to use. If you build something that is like a Me Too app, that's another WhatsApp, that's another Snapchat, People are not going to use it. So don't bother doing that. Don't waste your own time, right? Think about doing something novel. You know, the world has changed. Everything is different, right? Everything out there now has to be better, has to be better designed, has to be cheaper, has to be more powerful, and generally it just has to be more awesome. And uh, Eric Schmidt has really trumpeted this point in his new book about how Google works. Google is a product-centric company. You know, Every product they build has to pass the toothbrush test, right? I have to use it twice a day. If, if we don't use it twice a day, it's useless because it'll never get the audience and the usage that it needs to drive advertising revenue. So how do we build amazing things? So where does that leave us, right? There are two things you really need to focus on, is the idea and the product. And strangely enough, there is actually, as we were sort of talking about earlier before, there's a simple solution and a simple approach to building a billion dollar app. Very, very straightforward. I'll show it to you on this slide. There's a big red line here. You know, come up with a great idea. Okay, so you know, we've all got great ideas, but we need to validate these things. How do we validate them? Take them out to real users. The amount of startups that I talk to in the US and in other places, you know, whether it be the UK or France, especially talented developers, don't take to real people. Take your idea and validate it. The rule of thumb I use, and it sounds ridiculous, is talk to 500 people who would be users of your app, website, whatever your service is, and get their real honest feedback. Make sure it's not friends or family. You. Get real feedback, and you have to do that. And that doesn't require money, that doesn't require anything except time. The next bit bit is, especially on the mobile level, sure. <coughs> That is a good sample size. And you know what? It's really hard to find 500 people to talk to, which means you need to go out there, and whether it's in Starbucks on the corner or whether it's hassling people on the corner of the street, it means you need to have the confidence to go out there and talk to them. And that is a really interesting process because not only is it just going out there, but you've probably got 5, 10, 15 seconds to engage someone 
which means your pitch about what you're actually trying to sell has to be pretty good and has to be pretty clear, which means it has to be clear in your head. But more importantly, when you think about general and people talking to each other, if an app is doing really well and people want to spread it kind of via word of mouth, they need to be able to convince someone in one or two sentences, wow, you should check out this app because of this reason, download it, it does that. If you can't synthesize that and get feedback on that idea, then it's not going to work in the real world. And I use the word five, well, I use the number 500 because it's a good month's worth of work. You do about 100 a week, 25, 20 people a day, you'll be worn out. But the amount of data that you'll have and usually the first, second, third time people will shoot it down and destroy it, you'll be like, good, I'm really happy I didn't spend any time designing that, building that, spending money on contractors or wasting my time because the idea was rubbish. But the converse is also true is the moment your idea is really good, you get to the point three of that place where you're like, actually, you know what? I'm really confident in this idea. I know how to pitch it. I know how to pitch it succinctly. Now I can start translating it into a design of some sort. You know, use Photoshop, use PowerPoint, sketch up, and then kind of repeat that process again. Take that out to new people and be like, look, can I waste five minutes of your time? Can I buy you a coffee? Can I buy you a cup of tea? Can you check out you know, these pieces of paper? Here are my designs, or, or better um, than that is, you know, use Dropbox, share screenshots. Most people start playing around with your screenshots thinking it's an app. We spent the first two months of our new company building screenshots and testing it with about 2,000 people. And the feedback that we got on that was sensational. They were like, this is shit. This doesn't make sense. Why would I use this? Don't understand this language. Doesn't it look like this app? No, it's more like WhatsApp. That doesn't work. We're like, good. We didn't spend 20,000 on developers. We spent a few hundred on designers and getting to a point where all of a sudden the screenshots were really logical. And people are like, oh, that makes sense. And if I do this, oh, it does that. Great, love it. When can I have it? And you're like, oh, yeah, we haven't actually built it yet. But at least you're ready to build the right thing. The big bit, this big, huge red line, this is what guys in Silicon Valley do well. This is why you're here. You're here to learn one thing, which is how to cross that red line. And no one does this particularly well except here. And even here, there's only a few people who do this well. Kevin Systrom, when he was building... Instagram, you know, his product Bourbon, which was, hey, you check into places, find local places that are interesting, didn't get anywhere near to crossing that line. He didn't get what's called product market fit, which is basically, I'm creating a solution, I'm creating an app, I'm creating a website for this group of users. Do those users love my product so much that if I took it away tomorrow, 50% of them would be upset? So that's the metric to think about. Are you making 50% of people upset? Or if it went away tomorrow, would anyone even remember? Would they even care? If the answer is they don't care, something that's useless. And that's the long and the short of it. Because if you can't cross that line with something that people love, you're going to be spending a lot of time convincing people by being a good salesman that they should invest in your company, work for your company, and they should give you money for your company. And that's great. There are, there are lots of us who are really good salespeople who can do that. But the problem is, you go raise a couple million bucks, how are you going to get users to use your product? You can't convince users to use a product that's average. The market's too competitive. So, so this is the formula to make it a roaring success for something that makes millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. Your question that you need to ask yourself is, you know, do I want to turn that into a business or create a great app? Or to create a great the, 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 you know, the, creating a great website or a great app is perfectly fantastic. But you know, will it ever make enough money to support 100 employees? It, it really depends on what you want to do. So that is simply a question of scale. 
And it's a, it's a question of, you know, B2B as well. If you go down the B2B route and you're creating more enterprise type stuff, you probably don't need millions of users. You need thousands of users and thousands of loyal users. You know, if you look at the way Slack has been going recently, you know, they're raising it a billion dollars as well for a corporate internal communications tool, which is great, but they've been around for years. And it took them a long time to get that product market fit, whether they were too early or the market is only coming now. It's one of those opportunities. It depends what you want. Going big is not necessarily the best thing. It's complicated. It's a long process. There's lots of ways to fail. You know, frankly, exiting for a smaller amount of money with a small, really healthy, profitable app is probably a better option. But we're talking about something slightly different. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I think it's a great option. Once you cross that point and you've got something that people really love, that they're pulling for, that they're yearning for, that is really when viral marketing, you know, word of mouth really comes into play. And that's where it's all about scaling. And the sort of magical word of really getting, turning your users into customers somehow. Some companies achieve this by themselves. And you know, interestingly, all the accounts of WhatsApp and it's 450 million active users. You know, yesterday, Facebook published the financial results, including the financial results for WhatsApp for last year. $20 million in revenue. For a company that has the worldwide volume of SMS equivalent to every single telco, you know, and telcos make a lot of money off SMS, that company made 20 million bucks in revenue. Granted, they only have 55 employees, which is fine, but it's not the most valuable proposition. It pays its bills. Was it worth $20 billion? It's an interesting question. One interesting way to make a billion dollars, and someone sort of said this quite flippantly, is to, you know, to touch a billion people. But rather, it's to touch a huge amount of people. But let's dissect a quite interesting idea you know, that has happened not so much in the heart of Silicon Valley, but in the heart of Los Angeles, which is really interesting. And it's about the dating world. Does everyone know Tinder? Everyone familiar with the dating app Tinder? So Tinder is a, is a very interesting app. Let me explain it in a moment, but let me give you the context. They only launched about two and a half or three years ago. And they launched into an industry that anyone would say has been saturated. And I've worked in the dating industry, I've built a website there, I've gathered users and spent tons of money. And it's a complicated beast, right? Match Inc. is an $800 million a year business, it's got about 200 different websites underneath it. You know, it hasn't really changed its revenues, you know, it's growing very, very slowly. You know, eHarmony, which is one of these long-time dating companies, makes about $200 million a year. The Do has been in the sort of dating business, kind of social networky space for about 10 years. It's about seven, eight different websites that have all been aggregated and put together. And then, you know, the last example, which is quite interesting, is actually Madison, which is actually all about adultery. It's built for people who are married. And you can actually go on a dating website where you're married, she's married, but hey, we still want to date. And, you know, they just recently launched in Asia and they kind of doubled their revenues. So anyone would argue this space is actually quite quite, um, you know, full of competitors and isn't really changing much. But that, to some other ones, would actually insinuate that there's a huge opportunity there. Zeusk was the company that acquired my startup. So I quite like these guys. But even then, they acquired us in 2007. So it was quite a while. Sorry, we started in 2007. They, they acquired us in 2010. But even now, they're only just IPOing this year or just did IPO. But they're seeing that mobile is taking over all of their business. So... What was really so interesting about this new dating app called Tinder? It was started by a couple of college kids, actually four or five founders, depending on how you count it. There's a long, big backstory there, but they launched in fall 2012. Then they launched on Android. In spring 2014, they were used at the Olympics. And, and one of the principles behind Tinder is it's a location-based dating app. So all the Olympians in the Olympic Village were using Tinder on their phone, which would show them which other athletes were interested in meeting them. And they called it the Tinder Olympics because everyone was spending the night in someone else's room and it was all very quite interesting. But, you know, for a 40-person team, they got 1 billion matches on this app. Um, and then they grew to 2 billion in the summer of this year. But what made this app such a huge success? And it's sort of being valued at about a billion dollars now. But why did it really catch fire? First reason, and this is the interface of Tinder, 
is you get to see people who are near you, but all you see are the pictures and a little bit of information around them. And this is a real image I found on Tinder, <laughs> which is quite funny. But the whole point is, is you see it on your phone, you swipe through. You swipe left for no, and you swipe right for yes. So what it is, is it's a very, very optimized experience for mobile. And what they figured out very early on, they didn't actually even launch with the swipe interface that they're very, very famous for, is they actually launched with a different interface and they found users only looking at the pictures. And from my own experience in dating, we know that men are only interested in the pictures. 95% of their decision on whether to like someone or contact someone on a dating site is the picture. Women aren't much better, mind you. There are two factors that influence whether a woman will message you or uh, like you on a dating website. Picture is still number one, but it's only about 80%. What's the second factor? Salary. So, I don't know whether that's better or worse. Um, but they, they, they use this principle that we may not like or we may not agree with, but it drives our behavior, which is what makes them so popular. So obviously, here's a bit of a no. The second bit is that it's location-based. So, I get to see pictures of people around me right. That makes them very real swipe through them, and then if we both match, if we both say yes, it pops into a chat interface and I can start talking to them and say, hey, do you want to meet up? So in an industry that was seemingly saturated with no opportunities, these guys built a super simple app, a product that was absolutely amazing, really well executed, really fast, it performed really well. And what they were able to do is acquire tons of users, but I put a huge cross there because they haven't been able to convert them into customers. But there's actually a secret part to this story because it's a very famous company over here in the US and also in the UK, is that 85% owned by, funnily enough, the company that owns Match.com. A lot of their success in getting users so quickly was because they were getting users from Match and 200 other dating properties. So is it really a startup or not? It's a very interesting story. A good friend of mine's on the board of IAC, so you know th there are different ways to kind of paint these startups. So all I'm saying is it's quite tricky to read what you believe out there. So let's sort of change tack on it because one, one important thing that I do in the book these days is I think the business model is absolutely imperative and required if you're starting up these days. And why is it imperative? It gives you control. Even if you have a relatively you know, weak business model, but frankly an amazing product like WhatsApp, WhatsApp was able to stand out from the crowd and not take funding for a significant period of time and only took funding when they needed it because they had the cash to cover all their costs, because they had cash to pay all their salaries. You know, you can either lose, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20% of your company by being quite wise, or you can lose 50, 60, 70% of your company by giving away that equity to invest because you have no leverage. So I would always say, work on the business model, it can only help you. One interesting thing, and I'll sort of go into the example of Halo and what we did, which was quite interesting, is Halo is a taxi app. We launched about one year after Uber did in the US, and initially we focused on London. And the transportation problem is a two-headed problem, right? You've both got drivers and you've both got passengers, and it's not the easiest thing in the world to solve. Whenever you're trying to create an ecosystem or a community or a network, it's incredibly difficult because the buyers are only gonna come if the sellers are in the community, and the sellers are only gonna come if there are buyers. So how do you break this chicken and egg problem? And it's the same thing if you're trying to do a transportation app. Uber had the same problem. How do I get drivers on my network if there's no one ordering a taxi? How do I get people to order a taxi if I have no drivers? So it was by pure luck that I came across the founder of Halo, a guy called Jay Bregman. He said, you know what, I've got an amazing idea. He's like, what is it? I'm like, it's a taxi app. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, taxi apps are cool, that's interesting. What are you going to do that's different? And he's like, I've got a way to break the chicken and egg problem. And I was like, great, I want to hear it. He's like, here's what we do. We build a great product, we build a great app for drivers that does not require passengers. I've spent the last year or so 
working with three taxi drivers who have got 60 years experience in the space. Grab some water. And they've basically told me that there are three key problems that drivers have that we can solve with an app and it's got nothing to do with more business and passengers. First one is they have no idea how profitable they are and when they should be driving. So let's give them some basic analytics. If we give them an app that rides in their smartphone for free that tells them when they're empty, when they're busy, where they're picking up jobs, where they're not picking up jobs, we're going to give them a pretty good indication of how long they should be driving, where they should be driving for free. That's pretty interesting. Second, drivers are really, really social creatures. If we told drivers that they had a tool to communicate to one another where there are jobs, you know, often they'll be driving past like a baseball stadium or a football stadium, and they'll see that all of a sudden there's a game coming out. They'll be like, wow, you should come here. There's another 20, 100 people who need a taxi. They have no broadcast mechanism to do this. And third of all, at the time, less than 1% of all transactions in, in taxis were on credit card. They didn't have the credit card facilities. They um, basically weren't that interested in taking them because the commissions were being charged that were really high on the devices they could put in their taxis. So we're like, why can't we just allow them to process credit cards in a smartphone app? We don't need a reader. We can put in the number. They can send you a receipt via email. We can, we can process the payment. And it's free. We will eat the charge. Those three things got the first few thousand drivers on Halo. That allowed us to have a fleet of a few thousand active drivers driving every single day. All of a sudden, we could start marketing to passengers and say, wow, we have this fleet of 2,000 drivers that are out there on the streets every day. If you open the app, and actually, you'll see that there are actually drivers driving around on the app. If we did this six months earlier, there wouldn't be a little driver icons anywhere. I'll go, I'll go into the story of how Uber did this, and even better than we did it. But because we were able to do that day one in London, we had a business that grew to $100 million in London in under two years, just in London. And now we're in 18 cities. Unfortunately, we did announce about a week ago that we pulled out of all of North America, which is a bit of a problem. Um, but we're focused kind of on other countries as well. So I hope the team will do really well in those places. But one really, really important thing to remember is the user experience of this app won us an App of the Year award from Apple. And there's a few things here kind of worth mentioning is the first time user experience was able to deliver on the promise. When someone opened an app, that was the first thing they saw. They didn't have to see a registration screen. They didn't see some crummy tour that is just annoying. What they saw was a screen that anyone could understand. It said, get a taxi in three minutes. Clearly, you're the little blue guy in the middle hailing a taxi. You could see the taxis around you. They would be moving in real time based on their location. That real estimate of how long it would take the next one to come was a real-time estimate that was calculated in real time. And you had one super simple call to action, which is pick me up here at a location that we found for you. Users love that. Even if they didn't want to take a taxi now, their first experience, if someone told them about the app, was amazing. They're like, wow, this works. This has I get how to use it. I don't need to do anything else. So remember that the threshold is super high. If you were an app, trying to compete against Halo in London or any other number of cities that required users to first register, then go through a tour, you've probably already lost 50% of people who download. So there are really important things to kind of consider. So again, going through this whole process of creating you know, and testing a great idea that we did with drivers, going out there and talking to them, validating the driver app, breaking the chicken and egg dependency, getting to a product market fit in one city and then scaling it out to another 17. These guys, though, did it way better. In the, in, in the space that we grew to a multi-hundred million uh, dollar company, they grew into a multi-billion dollar company. So what did these guys do that was better? First of all, they can launch a city with one person and they can launch a city tomorrow. What Uber has been able to do is because they offer all different kinds of vehicles. They offer taxis in some cities, they offer cheap cars, they offer middle of the road cars, luxury cars, whatever you want. They can go into a city and offer a product that people there want. 
and they can very easily trade up and down. But they also don't have to recruit drivers for the majority of the services they offer. They go in there and they do partnerships with limousine companies, with black car companies. They offer the money and say, look, we are going to buy the hours from your drivers so long as you guarantee that they accept our jobs. It's their job to market the service to users. But what they can do is they can have one guy go to a city. He can do a bunch of deals, sign up a few different providers with 25 cars, 100 cars, 200 cars here. All of a sudden, they have the supply that they need. They don't need to build a great app for drivers. In fact, the driver app used to be rubbish. It used to be a hollow shell that basically just put up a driver offer, and they had to accept it. But because they were using contracted drivers, the drivers didn't have a choice. They didn't have to win the driver's attention. So that was a really good step by them. But what they've also been able to do is use that foothold and that very, very low cost of entering a new city to actually drive profitability in their cities very, very early on. And now, you know, they're in 204 cities, 45 countries. They're probably going to do gross fares of about $8 billion this year. So the 18-odd billion valuation that they've justified doesn't seem too crazy. And on top of that, they take a 20% margin of what the driver earns for them, and Halo could only take 10. So every one of those aspects, the business model, how profitable the business model was, has enabled them to go crazy. So where does this leave us again, right? On average, the average person, all of you here today, whether you believe it or not, will look at your smartphone 150 times a day. And this is how it breaks down in terms of frequency. So obviously miscellaneous, God knows what that is. But voicemails, charging your phone, random web, down to gaming, music player, clock, voice calls, messaging. That's why people are focused on those areas at the bottom around messaging and voice. But here's a great one, clock. Where's the billion dollar clock app? We look at our clock that often. Why hasn't someone done something clever with the clock or the calendar? Because you've got the audience there. You've got the attention. Where's the novel product? Where's the novel You know, there's two and a half billion people with smartphones out there looking at the clock about 18 times a day. No one's taking advantage of it. So here's one really interesting quote that I quite like by, by Ev Williams. It's a bit long, but bear with me because I think it's quite interesting. Any big idea is going to take a while to get there. By definition, if it's big and no one has done it before, it's not going to be as simple as one, two, three, we got it. There's going to be a dark period in there because you don't know what the key to getting there is. You have to be willing to be in some murky territory and be prepared to invest if you really want to do something different. And that's what I'd really encourage everyone to do. That's what I think about every day when I get up about the product that we're building is, why is it different? Will a normal person believe that it's different and really find it different and therefore helpful? Because I don't want to get up and work as hard as I do for an idea that's not going to work. That's really good when you're in your early 20s because it doesn't matter. It's all good experience. But, you know, you get a bit older, you get into your 30s and so forth. You don't have that much time left. So you want to focus on something that's really going to work. So how do you do it? So there's two real options here, and I heard this from a great VC. If you want to build something great and different, you either have to build it 10 times better than the competition that's already out there, like these kind of apps, whether it's messaging or ways with directions or vibrant cacao talk or games, or you build something completely new that the market hasn't seen before. So whether it's Snapchat and exploding messages that disappear, which is based on a super interesting story, it was actually um, Evan Spiegel's mum was actually boasting to another mum uh, of a kid in the same school. And her little daughter overheard about the app that uh, Evan was building. And his mum was saying, you know, it's OK that he's dropped out of Stanford to build this app. And the other mother was like, this app sounds like it's good for sexting and sending naked pictures amongst kids. You know, I don't know this is a great idea. And I'm pretty sure he shouldn't have dropped out of Stanford for this. But the girl, who was about 12 years old, was actually saying, this is a really interesting app. She didn't say the next day she downloaded it, took it to school. And they have a really interesting problem at school. And you know, I don't know anyone here who's 12 or 11 years old, but there, there are two things that now happen with kids. One is your parents buy your phone. And that means they know how to get into your phone, and they look at everything that's on your phone. 
whether it's your email, your SMSs, you can't really lock it. Second, when you're in school and if you're doing something naughty like messaging in class when you shouldn't be, teacher will take your phone, have a look through it and shame you in class and be like, a nice joke, don't do that again. So this cheeky girl took Snapchat to class, was messaging someone else and very flagrantly in front of the teacher and the teacher said, come here, give me your iPhone, let's just have a look at this message. And she's like, where's the message? She's like, I don't know, miss, there is no message on my phone. It's disappeared, it's deleted. That moment, everyone in the class downloaded that app. The kids knew the problem and the power of what was going on. And that's the demographic that it took off from. But again, this is just like secret notes that we used to have in class where people used to you know, read the piece of paper, screw it up, put it in their mouth and swallow it. It's the same thing. So they've reinvented something and done it new. You know, Instagram was visual Twitter. It was making my pictures beautiful but posting them out in the public to get some kind of recognition. Square was about allowing people not to just type in card numbers into an app, but create a little swipey device that allowed any smartphone to effectively become a credit card machine. And Flipboard, even though it started as a website, took off because it was about a magazine that aggregated all my favorite magazines in a social way on the iPad. And it was the iPad that rocketed them to success, even though they started the company six months before the iPad was even launched. So that's why it's different. Let's flip slightly now to the psychology. I said before, if you want to make a billion dollars, you've got to touch a billion people, you know, more or less. There are 67 traits that every culture in the world shares. And there was a great sociologist over here from the University of Santa Barbara who came up with these 67 human universals. That's every culture that exists today in the world shares these characteristics. So. I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but it's a pretty good idea. If you build something that falls into this category, there's a great slide, isn't it? You know, 67 words stuffed onto a page that's barely legible, but I'm, I'm trying to make a point here. But the interesting thing, things like education, cooking apps, right? Calendars, folklore, giving, housing, religious rituals, trade, games, they're all there. They're all things people have exploited. These things have billion person audiences. There's one great app. Has anyone heard of Uversion? 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 It's been downloaded more than 150 million times. Makes a decent amount of money. It's available in 150 languages. What is it? It's a crowdsourced Bible app. It's a billion dollar app based off religion. If they actually monetized all those users, which they don't massively, that's not really their goal, there is a billion dollar opportunity that VCs, mind you, have actually tried to get them to monetize the app and turn it into a real business. So, you know, make something people want. But here's the bit that is really kind of encouraging, and these are sort of some of my final words, and I, I dig through much more of this kind of data in the book. The average of founders of consumer-centric mobile startups is 34 years old. So this isn't something that the Zuckerbergs do, typically the 18, 19-year-olds who do straight out of college. They've been around the block two or three times. The average age of an enterprise or B2B tech startup is about 37 years old. So we've still got some hope. You know, the average time to actually get to a billion dollar valuation, even though some people have done it in under 18 months, is actually seven years. That's seven years of lots of ups and downs. And if you look at Candy Crush and their IPO with King Digital, that was a 12 year journey of massive ups and downs. So. The one kind of last bit is, you know, you're all here for the same reason that I'm here. We all love the excitement of building something new, of an amazing journey. And I love this quote. Uh, it was actually Eric Schmidt when he was trying to seduce Sarah Sandberg to work for Google. You know, if you're offered a seat on a rocket ship, don't ask which seat, just get on. Because that's really part of the adventure. And the last thing, my new venture now, and I'd love to get your feedback on it, and feel free to tear it apart because this is all about real feedback, is our new app is called Ice Cream. And after talking to quite a few thousand people, we asked them one really simple question. You know, I wasn't that creative when I was trying to research my next company, which was, what is the single biggest issue that you have with your smartphone? With men, we got the issue of it keeps running out of battery power. It sucks, it keeps dying. With women, nine out of 10 women, and feel free to disagree with me, but I'd be curious to see what the number is, 
Nine out of ten women said, I keep running out of space. I keep filling up my phone. And we're like, what the hell do you keep filling up your phone with? I mean, and they're like, we take too many photos. And I don't want to sync them or delete them or back them up, but I keep taking photos and I keep getting that horrible, nasty pop-up of death that says, you know, please clear more space. So we've gone ahead and we've built a camera app that never runs out of space. You can keep taking photos till you're blue in the face. They will all be optimized and still on your smartphone, but they'll also be backed up to the cloud as well. So that's it. Questions? Is the name ice cream? Everybody loves ice cream. It's about nostalgia. It's about the summertime. It's about good memories. It's about sharing ice cream on the beach. We wanted something that makes people happy. Like Coca Cola is about happiness and friendship. It's got nothing to do with a drink. That, that's the theory, anyway. We'll see whether it works. Who knows? I think that's the stuff that we've most, we've all kind of seen different apps clearly on. Um, you know, there are definitely things in the calendar, cooking space, education, you know, folklore, games, hospitality, kin. But what I wanted to point out was, is they're the obvious ones. Look at all the ones in black that haven't actually had billion dollar opportunities, you know, created yet. Okay, uh, you were giving a very wonderful example of Uber. And uh, you've told us about them going um, B2B. So what was their uh, value prop going and actually acquiring interest of this business rather than actually acquiring the customers through the B2C channel? So what was their selling pitch of going to the limousine companies and actually offering? Oh, right, right. Um, uh, literally that they could get higher demand, guaranteed demand, and they would give them a higher margin. So, so they were able to go to a lot of companies once they generated certain demand. Well, it's also, it was a big chicken and egg problem too. So it was based very, very early on on the skill of the people negotiating, which was if we can guarantee you this many hours and this increase in margin, you know, will you work with us? Because their business is typically quite sporadic. Mm -hmm. They had to arbitrage that, basically. So if they provided it that week, they had to provide the demand. And that's what they were able to raise a lot of money for. And when they raise the big in Google of you know 1.2 billion, a huge amount of that cash was to bankroll that cycle, and to get it much much more efficient. Okay. And the second question I have is uh, you haven't touched anything about monetization strategies. So uh, what's what's your take on that? What uh, what you can actually recommend to the young startups? What what monetization strategies we should look at? Yeah. So th there's basically five business models that, that all successful apps have. So whether it's uh, you know a paid download, which is not particularly successful anymore, it's a valid business model, but it doesn't really work that much anymore. In-app payment, um, software as a service, or more of an enterprise model, which is a bit more of a kind of a seat licensing thing that we're seeing a few apps coming up with, or audience building. So basically, an audi audience building is, is like Instagram, basically our we will be able to do advertising because the product is so sticky. We have so much attention, um, but we haven't built an advertising organizational platform yet. We're going to you know, either predicate that on Acquirer or like Snapchat is doing now, they're actually building their own platform in there and trying to really build not a $1 billion business, but a $10 billion business out of it. And they seem to be getting the traction from it. Yeah, the, it's, we've only got an hour to kind of talk about stuff. We can spend another whole few hours just on business models and how to actually get there as well. Yeah? About, uh, uh, about finding uh, 500 people to test in my product. In rare place uh, I could find that that's people. That that's up to you to be creative, right? I mean, at, at the very the very simplest example is you go sit in Starbucks and you hassle every single person that walks in there. You know what we used to do at Halo and at other companies I've encouraged is every Friday, even when the company's developed and built up a new feature, 
Right, so we go to Cafe Nero, we go somewhere, you find people and you, 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 you have to seduce them into trying your idea or you ask them one question or you try and get their feedback or you do it with friends and family until you can get more people interested. The better your product proposition is, the easier it will be to test. If you find a lot of people who just don't even want to hear about it, then either you're going and finding completely the wrong people, so they're not going to be your target users, or your proposition or the way you're selling it is just not good enough. So that's the first barrier. Because put it this way, the, the bit that I like to say to people, and I've built and designed a lot of apps and worked with a lot of developers, is if you can't explain it to a person who thinks it's a good idea, you're not going to be able to explain it to a designer to design it well, and you're sure as hell not going to be able to explain it to an engineer to build it well. So start right back at the beginning, get the proposition right, get your idea right, how it's going to work, and then it will all come together. But do almost the hardest part first, which is convincing your end users that this is good by the value of the proposition and not because you're a really good salesperson. And I uh, have another question. Sure. Uh, tell us about difficulty in promotion and realization startup in your country, in the United Kingdom. I mean, everything's hard. I don't know, you know, what kind of what to say on that. I mean, what, what you need to have is really a proposition that really resonates. You know, when we've been going out and testing the proposition for ice cream, we're not trying to appeal to anybody. We're trying to appeal mainly to women. We're appealing to people with smaller memory um, and smaller space on their smartphones, people who really have that problem. What we need to do is find the channels that get to that audience and show them the product and how it works. But ultimately, they're going to respond to how good it is. But that's the kind of strategy that you have to come up with, which is, you know, what's the problem? Who am I going after? How do I get to them? What are the most cost-effective channels day one? And one of the other things that we've been able to do is partner with people who have similar audiences of people. So Candy Crush, for example, I've known the CEO there for a while. He said, look, if we can get good traction on our app, it might be something that is interesting for his audience as well. So can you people who have a similar audience to yours sell your idea in, into their organization in order to cross-promote these kind of things. I think a lot more startups could be doing that, you know, as well as all the other kind of advertising channels that are available as well. Thank you. Uh, do you have an estimate of average sort of marketing or customer acquisition or user acquisition cost for a new app launch? It is so variable by industry product, um, e even geography, that it, it's very, very hard to estimate that. Again, it all depends on the product, right? If you just look at keywords on, on Google for different kinds of products, you know, the, the average cost of acquisition for a banking customer is $200. The average cost of acquisition for a dating customer is $120. But that's because the average lifetime value, especially in banking, is much higher. I think you change banks once on average every seven years. Um, you know, dating typically makes just a bit more than that. But, you know, th there's a high churn rate around that. Whereas, you know, for a low price kind of consumer app, cost of acquisition, you know, might be in the pennies. So it, it depends entirely. I guess what I was trying to ask is, um, is there a, how much should we be estimating on marketing or those kinds of costs after an app launch? or at the time of an app launch? Again, it completely depends. There is no answer to that, right? Um, as much as you can. <laughs> oh, isn't that the best question in the world? Um, I, I think it's one of those ones where you know, one of the most common places that people find their co-founders is the place that they come from. You know, a huge part of a co-founder is someone you can work with really, really well. So if you're at a big or medium-sized company, find someone who compliments you. Work on the project, part-time. Work at work. Who cares what your employer, you know, I've very rarely been employed over the course of my entire life, so I'm all for kind of abusing employers like that. But, you know, do it at work. Do it at lunchtime. Do it after work. It's a great channel. If you can't get through that way, it's how good are you networking, right? And I think a huge part of that is having a very, very good idea of what you want to do and being able to pitch that clearly. Because part of the pitching process is to seduce anyone around you. 
Seducing developers to come work for your company, especially in this part of the world, is extraordinarily difficult. You know, in London, it's equally hard. I found my co-founder at a co-founder dating event with 400 people, and you know, uh, he was the only developer who gave a pitch about himself. And he developed more than 30 apps. I made a beeline straight to him. We chatted for a couple hours that evening. We met for lunch the next day. My was quite well developed <laughs> and kind of put together. And it just so happened to coincide with what he was interested in doing. But, you know, it took me a good three months of going to events every single week to kind of go through that kind of process. Um, but, you know, asking everyone and anyone. Um, one of the best channels I found, though, in, in just in terms of websites, I found LinkedIn to be quite useless, um, is AngelList. AngelList are people who really want to be part of startups. And if nothing else, they'll respond to you very, very quickly. And you can have great conversations and there's a large volume of them. And if you've got a good pitch, you're likely to have a lot of conversations. So uh, I just want to know if, uh, if you have to start the Halo app today, what are the things you would have done differently now that you mentioned about Uber, right? Um, Uber have a different business model and actually that's a much better business model than yours. I mean, I, I wouldn't start that business again today because that ship has sailed. But if we restarted it in, in the same time frame, knowing what I do now, I think one of the things that we would have done would be move into alternative types of vehicles in alternative markets way more quickly. We should have realized that taxis work in a handful of big cities really, really well, whether it's cities like London and, and Tokyo, who have very, very educated drivers, but who are very professional, very, very clean cars. But even cities like Istanbul that have uh, huge 25,000 driver populations of very professional yellow cabs. But in other cities, it's less professional, they're less clean, they're not really the preferred mode of transport. They're the types of cities that have responded so well to Uber. Clean cars, nice cars, well-trained drivers, bottles of water in the back seat for the same price or less than a taxi. And I think it's picking the right product for the right city is absolutely crucial. Because I, I still think Halo could work with a great cab focus in some cities, but a great black car focus in others. Model, how, how do you acquire first hundred customers? They're all your friends. They're, they're people that you've begged. The, the next level is a good product, and those people really recommending others, combined with some kind of paid advertising, combined with some kind of really targeted PR that you can do. So, for example, whether it even be in like the tech press, if you've built something that really resonates with that audience, or depending on what your target users are, if you're building, you know, a female-centric product, go after the women's magazines. You know, they write about apps, sites, and services all the time. Find a channel that's going to resonate with those and write some pretty hardcore stories, but maximize your chances of conversion. So if you're just launching and it's a premium product, give away the first thousand people who sign up the premium one for free. Put codes in those articles. Figure out any way that will give people a high likelihood to convert in those. After that, it becomes a hard slog of actually it needs to be good. People need to talk about it. People need to use it, need to love it. And then we need to use some kind of retention mechanism, whether it's push notifications, emails, and start creating a natural cycle of having people come back to the app or the service. Well, it's engaging the target users, right? So social, for example, we've gone through all of Instagram, found everyone with more than 20 or 30,000 followers who is clearly a keen photographer who takes a hell of a lot of photos who is most likely going to have filled their camera with photos who understands our proposition. And we've reached out to them and given away the free product. And, you know, it, they will most likely be interested. Second, they'll most likely download it and try it. It's up to the quality of the product, the design, and what you're actually doing to retain them. You know, if you test, if you get through to 100 or 200 of those and none of them use your product, you've built the wrong product. If they all start using it, great. Then you can pour some fuel on the fire, which is, hey, will you talk about this for me? Can we use you in an article? Can you 
you know, can we pay you to talk about this to your friends or will you do it for free? But you kind of realize very quickly that if the product is not, you know, if the product's a five or six out of 10, you're going to be pushing a boulder up a hill. If it's a seven or eight, yeah, people talk about it, you know, maybe not that enthusiastically, but they'll talk about it. The moment that it's like an eight and a half or a nine, your work suddenly becomes twice as easy, three times as easy. And everything you spend on it will actually build up users. But you know, that's the multiplier that you really need is does that product really work for my users? And I have focused on the right audience. And that's hard. And that, that can often take a, you know, a long period of time. Again, with all these guys who, who launched, they launched a product. They actually listened to the users that they came out with. And they kept saying, I actually want this. I want that. And then it's a very creative process of deciding what feedback to listen to. Does it align with your vision of what you actually wanted to build? Because if it doesn't, there'll be plenty of people who might tell you to do this or this. But if there's this interesting population that say, actually go down this path, and you iterate and you change, then that might be the right thing. But that's, that's the kind of skill of kind of product design and entrepreneurs is selectively listening to enough people and having that intuition about what to build or how to change it at the right time. I think all of those work in a similar way, right? The, the audiences are going to have slightly different flavors for those big, you know, multinational, international networks, including Instagram. But if you look at all, a lot of these up and comers, even, you know, WhatsApp was not primarily US, it was much more kind of European and East European as well. When you look at KakaoTalk or Line or some of these other apps, they're fundamentally Asian. So a lot of these network based type companies, it's all about getting you know, 10, 20, 30 million users in one dense region, which is really, really important. So I think no matter what you do, you have to find similar people. If you're a messaging app, language is going to be a fundamentally big part of your messaging app. You know, even for Instagram, I think Instagram was quite all over the place day one. You know, Snapchat is hugely American right now, but it's, it's changing and evolving as it goes. So it, it really depends, but you know, if you can, as, as a really interesting investor told me a couple of weeks ago, if you can be excellent somewhere or excellent within one realm, you can build off excellence, even if it's narrow. You can't build off something broader and mediocre. It's much harder. So whether it's focusing on a particular region or a certain type of people, you know, IM is, is a great you know, Berlin-based kind of photography community, which is about 10 million strong, but they've got a huge following in the US as well. You know, if you can get that niche and strong community based on something that is really shared in common, then you've got different opportunities. It really depends on what your assessment and how well you know those markets. You know, if if you if you know the language and well, it, it depends on you, right? So I, I'm lucky. One of our co-founders at Ice Cream, she speaks Japanese, Ukrainian, Russian, English, and Spanish. So we, can, we can expand into those markets relatively easily because we can support them. Not only can we translate the app, but we can understand and support our users should they start giving us feedback. So that's okay. If we couldn't do that, I wouldn't advertise doing it too aggressively, but in some senses, you can't control it. So I would release it in English if it's a, a universal app or in universal languages in any country, but it really depends, right? We couldn't do that with Halo. You can't do that with Uber. You know, they're very kind of city-based. When it's commerce-based or shipping-based, you've got other considerations. Typically with games, it's a bit harder. You know, that was one of the real big driving motivations of Rovio and Angry Birds is they didn't want any words in the game. They wanted sound effects and graphics, so it would be universal day one. So they actually stripped out all the text and really wanted to make it gesture-based and focused on the iPhone for exactly your reason. They tested it in a few 
um, example kind of countries, you know, the Nordics and New Zealand and a few other places, and then they pushed it out but had to get mass distribution. But it made it easier because the product had very little language in it. Depending on what you're doing. I mean, I think you can judge what is reasonable that's not going to stretch or destroy you. But if it's going to get you users and usage and you can support it, go for it. Donald Brown from UC Santa Barbara. I didn't make it up. <laughs> he may have made it up, but I didn't make it up. No, no, so that, that, that is actually, I think it's actually a copyrighted list that we had to kind of apply to him to get permission to reprint as well. So it's a very, very re well-researched list of human universals from him. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hello. So I wanted to ask a question. What would you uh, advise to entrepreneurs who are going through the tough times and are wondering whether they should still persist or yeah, like, or whether you know, they have to pivot, iterate? So it's like, how do you um, d recognize the fine line between even though if you're talking to your customers and you know, okay, follow, following your vision? I mean, that, that, that's a, a very, very difficult question. Um, you know, a huge part about it is, you know, talk to your users. If you, depending on what your users are saying to you. You know, one thing is, you know, I would always talk to investors and people who are experts in a field. They don't know a lot about necessarily running companies in terms of the day-to-day -day and those kind of details, but they're amazing on a strategic, broader, bigger picture level. But if you're really talking to your users and you've got the right users and you're really, you know, being honest with yourself, then you probably won't get into that kind of position, right? It, it's when you delude yourself that there's actually something real there. And, you know, you've got to give yourself a time horizon about what you need to demonstrate, right? Is it actually going to be a good business and popular? Is it ever going to actually make any money? If it's something that's not going to make any money, then don't raise millions and millions of dollars and have a huge team because you're going to run into some problems somewhere. So I think there's this kind of just general management kind of um, objectivity to figure out what is actually going to be sustainable. But, you know, that's why the lean startup is such a great principle, which is do it as lean as you can for as long as you can until you get product market fit and you can see the adoption. If you're getting real, real adoption and traction, it will make money at some point, even if it's years down the line. And that's what Silicon Valley is really good at. So. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you very much. It was absolutely awesome. Oh, one more, one more question. You might have covered. I came in late, but what's your thoughts on the WhatsApp sort of model of you know a buck a year? I mean, compared to a, I mean, there's some debate that you know if you give your app away, no one wants to. A freemium model, you know, nobody wants to do it. But if you do a a dollar after a year, it's sort of a novel concept that people will want to pay something and then it's value. It's, w when you look at the numbers for it, I, I sort of mentioned earlier on actually the Facebook just published the numbers on WhatsApp for last year and it yeah. made about 20 million in revenue. So 20 million off the back of 450 million actives, they're not getting a lot of recurring revenue there. So the notion that they're really toggling this up and down all the time is perhaps less accurate than we've been led to believe. Yeah. Um, but w what I think it is, is it's super clever that it has been turned on, right? One, one of the bits of research in the book is the only people who ever paid that dollar ever were iOS users. And it started off as a premium download. Right. Then it started off as a one buck, um, one off payment in-app purchase. Then it turned into a one app, one dollar recurring upfront payment. Now it's a one dollar recurring tail end payment. So all that suggests to me is that people have become way more finicky and way less likely to pay over time and they've only ever monetized iOS users. They've never monetized Android, BlackBerry, or any other platform. So, but you know what? Well, it depends what your model is. It covered the costs of the business, which is five cents per user per year, and it paid for all their employees and gave them the independence to run the business that they wanted and to get Jan Coombe on the board of Facebook. Sure. So, so you just sort of led to believe that it was a lot larger than 20 million. Or exactly million. right. We all thought it was sort of 60, 70, 80 sure, million, right, which right. would have been ridiculous. Right. But it turns out it wasn't. So.
Cool. Thank you, everyone. A pleasure. <laughs> Sorry. Devices. It's quite, it's quite yeah. Too, but, yeah. Right. Sorry about that. But you did, you did great with that. Yeah. It's okay. As long as everyone can hear. Yeah. It, 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 it worked. Oh, did you go in front of us? Yeah.